they have to protect him. But as soon as he's released from court. (laughs) Okay, here's my understanding of it so far. If a lawyer wants to come to correct me, go for it. So you were asking for a lawyer. I think he. Hold on, I just got. I think somebody just linked these indictments. Are these the indictments? Uh, looks like it. It has been long rumored that Trump was like an informant for the National Enquirer. He still denies that he even Stormy Daniels. What a wild timeline we're in right now, Jesus. Live stream. Quite striking, but seeing that wide shot where he is at the defense table and you see the court police, he's in custody, he's he's in their control, uh, I, I think is very striking. It's almost like any other defendant right. on any other day sitting in a courtroom. Donald Trump Jr. just tweeted a picture of the judge's daughter saying she worked for the Biden-Harris campaign seems to be relevant. Oh my God. It is not relevant. It is not relevant. She's an individual adult. But this is what I was about to True, say. True, that's game what about play. It's not a game. Love. It's not a game. This is how they play. Right. Uh, they try to intimidate, they attack, and they put at risk people who should not be dragged into this process. If Donald, Donald Trump is presumed innocent, if he can beat these charges, good for him. The judge's daughter has nothing to do with this, but this is what they do. This is how he, they have so taken this country off the rails and outside and the norms. And there's a reason why they took the uh, prosecutor's pictures off the, off the website for, for similar reasons. And it's really unfortunate that that is a world in which we live and you have uh, people on social media doing what you just described. One of the people in recent years um, well, before he became president, that he used as his chief henchman, this is what he calls himself, henchman. was Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen was the man who kept him out of the very situation that we are looking at that he is in right now. And today, because Michael Cohen turned after he uh, took the fall for Donald Trump, that is why Donald Trump is sitting there right now. The man that he employed put him there. And again, it is not only necessarily... Michael Cohen's testimony, we believe there's certainly documentation and evidence that are going to go into these 34 counts that we're going to see soon, but that those turn, that, that turn of events is quite noteworthy. Karen, I want to ask you a question and then throw back to Anderson. Um, when somebody within the president's, the former president's circle, like his son uh, or a campaign or, or people directly affiliated with him, posts an image of the daughter of the judge at a time where political violence uh, is increasingly becoming more and more normal and more and more accepted. Is that something that the judge could admonish uh, the defendant uh, and those in his immediate circle to not do? Or is that something that people just now accept as a modern reality? No, that will that will not be accepted. That will not be okay. In fact, the fact that this is going on significantly longer than anyone would have anticipated, much longer than a normal arraignment, leads me to believe that the judge is having some sort of very serious discussions in court right now because oh, the motion arraignment practice is happening right all now, the things that Donald Trump wants to do, make the arguments about whether the statute of limitations or sufficiency of the grand jury or whether a charge counts as elevating it to a false false business record. That will all be done in writing, in uh, motion practice. It will be briefed by lawyers at another date. Right now, the only thing that's happening in court Um, is just supposed to be an arraignment. It would not be anything about custody or bail since this crime is not bail eligible. So a grand jury reviewed some evidence that was brought to them by prosecutors, and the grand jury has to decide, hey, are we going to charge this man, Donald J. Trump, with a crime? They've decided, yes, we are going to charge him with a crime. And so the next step of that is once they file the paperwork, now there's an arraignment. An arraignment is when a person is 
essentially arrested or detained, I guess, right? Or a person is brought to a courthouse where a judge is gonna read off, hey, just so you know, you're being formally charged with a crime. These are the crimes that you're charged with. I think you have the ability right now to enter a guilty or not guilty plea. And then I think you're taken into custody and then the um, court process begins. I think he is, he is being arrested now, right? After this, after the arraignment or... That's another, he's, they are committing more crimes. And so whether he gets arrested for them is a, a decision that will have to be made by law enforcement. But I can assure you, I don't know you, if he goes back judge, to Mar He might judge go back Marchand home on house arrest. I'm not sure. He might not get arrested. He, he, he might not go to jail. He might go back to house arrest. And knows the Trump organization and Trump and his ways and his allies. He, he sat and was the judge who presided over the Trump organization trial. So he is not a stranger to the ways of Donald Trump and Donald Trump's uh, orbit. And he will absolutely have a pre-prepared and pre-planned speech and admonition that he is giving to, uh, to def he is defendant Trump right now before Judge Mershon and letting him know what that means and what as the judge of this court will expect of him as a defendant. Anderson, back to you. Yeah, uh, Adam Kaufman, who's been watching this. Adam, so in a YouTube chat, said he's not getting arrested. They offered the to do this over a Zoom call. One possible. Do you know the DA is getting around the statute of limitations? Yeah, there's a way to do that. I'll explain after this, I think. So obviously, any uh, thought that the president, former president, was going to be uh, coming to cameras and not, not uh, obviously not happening. Whether or not he wanted to, we don't know. Uh, he is still in the custody, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ellie, he is still in the custody of, of authorities. He is until he walks out that door, Anderson. He is in the custody of the Manhattan District's attorney, District Attorney's Office. He presumably has been released on his own recognizance, which means he will come back Tomorrow whenever he is told. We should get a sense of what the schedule is. What we will learn coming out of this, of course, the biggest thing is the indictment itself. And we're still waiting on that. It has now been unsealed. It should be available to the public. It's possible they were waiting for this proceeding to end before they posted it. He, he's no longer in custody now. He's he's under guard because he they have to protect him. But as soon as he's released from States. court, <laughs> he's no longer in we custody. We believe he's leaving now. I believe John. So presumably he was released on his own recognizance. We don't. We have ears in the courtroom, but uh, they're trying to get to. Uh, places to communicate to us, but he'll um, he'll get in the same motorcade package that brought him here. That will take him back to LaGuardia Airport, where his plane is standing by. This is all subject to change, but the the plan was to fly out of New York today on his private jet to Mar-a-Lago, uh, without coming back to Trump Tower to hold a press conference. And what we've seen is. Uh, for all the discussions about making a statement on the way in or a statement on the way out at the courthouse, that hmm. obviously didn't happen. So I wonder why he didn't make any statements. That motorcade is now on the move. To, uh, Kara Scannell, uh, got just got out of the courtroom. Kara, what have you learned? The former president pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. Those are all felony counts. All, so said that this all 34 was counts were just on the falsifying records? And involved the payment of is that one? Do we know that or is she just speaking? Stormy Daniels. Um, as part of the, the allegations, prosecutor said that this was part of an effort to promote his candidacy by burying negative stories ahead of the election. And now, we don't have all the additional details of what else might be included in this, but that is how they outlined it in court. Now, in this, in this brief, well, it was a, about a 45-minute arraignment, when the former president entered the room, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. He walked in, he licked his lips, he was standing each of the rows. Thanks for the dramatic the rating. Press. There were about 60 members of the press in there, each row flanked by court security officers. Uh, we were not allowed to use any electronic devices, so we've all have kind of been filing out now to report the news. Um, he spoke only a few times. He entered the plea, not guilty, on his own. He also was addressed by the judge, um, who addressed to him some of the threatening statements that he made. That was something that prosecutors had raised. They had asked the judge not to impose any kind of gag order, but just to raise the potential issues of Trump's threatening social media posts. They handed up copies of those posts to the court and to Trump. Uh, the judge said that he was not going to impose any kind of gag order. He said it, he wouldn't, even if he was asked right now, but he did warn the former 
And also the prosecutor to warn their witnesses to tamp down their rhetoric to reduce what they are saying about the case. And the judge warned both sides, but particularly speaking to former President Trump, not to make any statements that would incite any violence or threats against any officials. We are getting our first look at the indictment and with the proviso that we've not yet had a chance to read all of it. A couple of initial impressions. First of all, this is what we call a bare bones indictment, contrary to what we were discussing before. This essentially just lays out the statutory language, the name, the date of each offense, but there is not a lot of detail in what we're oh, seeing have at this moment. Uh, there do appear to be 34 charges in here. There does not appear to be, and we're looking at it for the first time, there does not appear to be a conspiracy charge per se. Now that it doesn't mean they, to they can still explain the whole scheme at trial, but it looks like these are charges based on falsifying of business records it and then falsifying that, business right? records in order to commit to or conceal election. some other yeah. crime. So those are some initial impressions as we page through this. Okay, here's my understanding of it so far. If a lawyer wants to come to correct me, go for it. So the problem is falsifying records is like a class Z misdemeanor. That's some shit where they you come in and you like pay 20 bucks and you leave. It's a stupid, nobody cares about this shit. Um, the only way to, now, why people are saying that this is political, why people are frustrated over this is that in order to bump that up from a class Z misdemeanor to something that's actually worthwhile is you, you have to overcome the statute of limitations, meaning the time to press charges for that crime has already expired. I think it's like three years or something. It's already expired for when those payments were made. But if that misdemeanor was committed in order to in order to cover up another crime so something related to election fraud or or misappropriation of campaign funds or whatever if it was um committed to cover up another crime that means that now you can upgrade these charges to something where the statute of limitations wouldn't have passed but that but that's what we want to know from the indictments everybody wants to know what are you saying that he was covering up these um payments for nobody actually gives a about the, these misdemeanor charges, they want to know why these misdemeanor charges were upgraded. If we don't get that information today, we're not really getting anything, which sucks, but. In the business records of various entry entities in New York. So the, so the DA's office here is relying on election laws as the crimes that were being either concealed or committed to elevate the falsifying business records to a felony. It says one component of the scheme was that hey. at the defendant's request, a lawyer who then there. worked... Hello? Who joined? Oh, it's eSports. Oh, hi. Um, you were asking for a lawyer... Wait, I think you hold on. I'm a, I just got. I think somebody just linked these indictments. Are these the indictments? Uh, looks like it. Is it people? The lady here just said that it was your standard language. Let me. And that's what see. it looks like. This is the first time I'm looking at it too. So give me just a second. Um, the defendant in the in the county of New York and elsewhere on or about February 14th, 2017, with intent to defraud and intent to commit another crime and aid and conceal the commission thereof, made and caused a false entry in the business records of an enterprise. But yep. we're not going to know what that other crime is, right? That's not in these indictments. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't look like it is. This is literally a Mr. Girl hit. Well, because this is just copy pasted. Every single count is going to be the exact same, right? Yeah, it looks like it's. There doesn't seem to be anything. It's just saying that it's according to uh, invoices by Michael Cohen. Yeah, so each so of these charges, I'm guessing, is probably just for another entry in the books. Yeah, each entry, well, they kind of already hinted at that, that each entry in the books is going to be its own count. Yeah, which of course, is which is, I think, kind of normal, for. but I think the... But what we're curious about is the other crime that's being covered up. Yeah, and I think that's that's the bigger issue. The other thing that's missing here, and that's going to go to your discussion of the statute of limitations and the uh, difficulty with that, is going to be the lack of a conspiracy charge. Because I don't know if you saw what I linked earlier, but there was a New York attorney who was talking about the fact that for a first degree conspiracy charge, there is no statute of limitations. In, mm -hmm. in but I, but New we York. don't see any of that in these indictments. Yeah. So how, how can they charge these with intent to cover up another crime? Can they do that without charging the other crime? I mean, presumably that's going to come out during trial or it's going to come out during discovery or subsequent stuff. Um, Wait, hold on. That can't, what you just said can't be real. You can charge me with a crime past the statute of limitations with the hope that in discovery you can figure out something to make that charge no, 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 stick? No, 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 no. What I'm, what I'm saying is, as far as we understanding the public, 
that's going to be probably subject to later on when we find out. That may be something that they have already discussed as part of this. Um, but to that same end, it, it depends on what they're going to do. I, I'd be interested to see exactly what the DA is going to do, because like I said, this, yes, it's very bare bones, but it doesn't even include like facts or anything. It just yeah. says due to a invoice given to Michael Cohen and uh, a writ enterprise writ a Donald J Trump revocable trust account bearing check number okay so they charge, are wait also can I ask can you charge other crimes during discovery yes like you can have superseding indictment look at FTX okay. great example where they're constantly finding new stuff based on what they're finding through the initial investigations with mm -hmm. Sam Bankman Freed it's called a superseding indictment and that's it, or subsequent indictments okay the idea being that as you be, especially with complicated criminal transactions mm -hmm. you might find additional stuff um let me see if i can just find a good example for our chat to just link it but it's it's additional charges that are filed after the original indictment and here you go i mean I, I'll you just tell me i believe you i was curious well no i mean it's from another law firm in case you want you know but the idea here is that they're going to okay let's see your thoughts on this that's a lot of felony counts well yeah that's we're reading it right now <laughs> so, but um the the idea is that once you find more additional information you can make additional charges um for they, this uh, though, they must already have the conspiracy in mind though to overcome the statute of limitations on this right well, what's super interesting about this is not just the fact that they have the information, but more to the fact that they're identifying individual check numbers. So, presumably, they're going to be able to more or less tell people what's going on. This is... Oh, hold on. Oh, Wait, are you okay. reading the statement of fact? Statement of fact. Okay. Yep, I'm here we go. Okay. Right? Yep, 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 yep. Okay. <clears throat> the defendant, Donald J. Trump, repeatedly and fraudulently falsified New York business records to conceal criminal conduct that hid damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. From August 2015 to December... Tw oh, wait, hold on. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, these are criminal charges, meaning all of this has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, correct? Correct. Okay, all right. From August 2015 to December 2017, the defendant orchestrated a scheme with others to influence the 2016 presidential election by identifying and purchasing negative information about him to suppress its publication and benefit the defendant's electoral prospects. So this is the scheme that people were talking about that was going to be tried legally that I believe is untested, or I don't know if anybody's done a charge like this before, but the idea is essentially that they found these fraudulent business transactions, but they're upgrading these because they've got it's in the commission of another crime, which is trying to influence the election. Um, through payments that weren't properly accounted for, um, but it'll get, it'll get more. Uh, well, that last sentence is also super interesting, right? The mm -hmm. participants also took steps that mischaracterized for tax purposes the true natures of the payment made in furtherance of the scheme. Yeah. To me, that seems like they might also be going for a tax angle to say that they were trying to shield, uh, basically commit tax fraud. Oh, maybe. Which, yeah, but it's got to be something more severe for Donald J. Trump, the ex-president of the United I mean, States. It's got to be something more than tax fraud. But I mean, I they got him we'll on yeah, tax well, for Capone, so... Yeah, but again, but we'll, we'll see. In order to execute the unlawful scheme, the participants violated election laws, this is, I think, a big one, and made and caused false entries in the business records of various entities the state of New York. The participants also took steps that mischaracterized, for tax purposes, the true nature of the payments made in furtherance of the scheme. One component of the scheme was that, at the defendant's request, a lawyer who then worked for the Trump Organization as special counsel to defendant, Lawyer A, this is Michael Cohen, I believe, covertly paid $130,000 to an adult film actress shortly before the election to prevent her from publicizing a sexual encounter with the defendant. This would be Stormy Daniels, I believe. Um, lawyer A made the $130,000 payment through a shell corporation he set up and funded at a bank in Manhattan. This payment was illegal, and Lawyer A has since pleaded guilty to making an illegal campaign contribution and served time in prison. Further, false entries were made in New York business records to effectuate this payment, separate and apart from the New York business records used to conceal the payment. 
After the election, the defendant reimbursed lawyer A for the illegal payment through a series of monthly checks. First, from the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust, the defendant's trust, a trust created under the laws of New York, which held the Trump Organization entity assets after the defendant was elected president, and then from the defendant's bank account. Each check was processed by the Trump Organization, and each check was disguised as a payment for legal services rendered in a given month, 2017, pursuant to a retainer agreement. The payment records kept and maintained by the Trump Organization were false New York business records. In truth, there was no retainer agreement, and Lawyer A was not being paid for legal services rendered in 2017. The defendant caused his entity's business records to be falsified to disguise his and others' criminal conduct. Um... Wait, so, so far, the only criminal contact described is the tax thing, right? And the falsification so of what? Well, but the, I mean, the thing that would upgrade it from the misdemeanor to the... Yeah. To the felonies. And then... The, okay, all right. The, the potentially, because there's, there's a sovereignty issue with potential um, election fraud payments as far as to whether or not that the state can get involved in that. Sure. But we'll see I'm, how okay, that once shakes out. Yeah, okay. Background. The defendant is the beneficial owner of a collection of business entities known by the trade name the Trump Organization. The Trump Organization comprises approximately 500 separate entities that, among other business activities, own and manage hotels, golf courses, commercial real estate, condominium developments, and other properties. The Trump Organization is headquartered at 725 Fifth Avenue in New York County. From approximately June 2015 to November 2016, the defendant was a candidate for the Office of President of the United States. On January 20th, 2017, he became President of the United States. The scheme. The catch and kill scheme to suppress negative information. During and in furtherance of his candidacy for President, the defendant and others agreed to identify and suppress negative stories about him. Two parties to this agreement have admitted to committing illegal conduct in connection with the scheme. In August, of, what are the, wait, the two parties, one is Michael Cohen, is there, who's the second person? Um, probably Pecker, who is the head of the National Enquirer. What was, he was illegal part about of, what he did? Um, I guess because he worked as an intermediary to broker the deals, and because my understanding was the National Enquirer, um, more or less facilitated a lot of the stories being bought and the negative uh, headed off much of the publicity that would be negative towards Donald Trump. Um, it has been long rumored that Trump was like an informant for the National Enquirer. So a lot of like the celebrity gossip that they were getting their hands on happens to do with that. Um, Alan Weisselberg is another person who is the former CFO of the Trump industry, so it could be him as well. Okay, as far Someone as this... the Weisselberg guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. In August of 2018, lawyer A, that's Cohen, pleaded guilty to two federal crimes involving legal campaign contributions and subsequently served time in prison. In addition, in August of 2018, American Media Inc., AMI, a media company that owned and published magazines and supermarket tabloids, including the National Enquirer, admitted in a non-prosecution agreement that it made a payment to a source of a story to ensure that the source did not publicize damaging allegations about the defendant before the 2016 presidential election and thereby influenced that election. And that non-prosecution agreement is going to be super interesting because mm -hmm. the details of that, as far as what they... Uh, testify to is going to be uh, instructive for a lot of things because it might open up the case to not just be about Stormy Daniels or what was the other one? Karen McDougal I think it is. Some other parts it of might involve other people and it might involve other stories or other payoffs over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2015, Trump Tower meeting. In June of 2015, the defendant announced his candidacy for president of the United States. Soon after, in August 2015, the defendant met with lawyer A and AMI's chairman and chief executive officer, um, the AMI CEO, at Trump Tower in New York County. At the meeting, the AMI CEO agreed to help with the defendant's campaign, saying that he would act as the eyes and ears of the campaign by looking out for negative stories about the defendant and alerting loyal lawyer A before the stories were published. The AMI CEO also agreed to publish negative stories about the defendant's competitors for the election. Jeez. Suppressing the Dorman story. A few months later, in or about October or November of 2015, the AMI CEO learned that a former Donald Trump Dorman, the Dorman, was trying to sell information regarding a child that the, that the defendant had allegedly fathered out of wedlock. 
oh my god he's getting drake uh meeked or whatever what the fuck is it so this actually i guess this implies a potential third woman at the very least um, maybe well wait i don't even know if this is true let me just keep reading here because yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying mm-hmm. at the ami ceo's direction the ami negotiated and signed an agreement to pay the, the doorman thirty thousand dollars to acquire exclusive rights to the story AMI falsely characterized this payment in AMI's books and records, including in its general ledger. AMI purchased the information from the doorman without fully investigating his claims, with the AMI CEO directed that the deal take place because of his agreement with the defendant and lawyer A. Or Pusher T, not Meek Mill. My bad. When AMI later concluded that the story was not true, the AMI CEO wanted to release the doorman from the agreement. However, lawyer A instructed the AMI CEO not to release the doorman until after the presidential election, and the AMI CEO complied with the instruction because of his agreement with the defendant and lawyer A. I think that the... the Search and kill shit is probably okay, or the catch and kill scheme for news stories is probably okay, but probably not to influence an election. I think as a normal, like, mean of business, you can buy and kill stories if you want to do that, but I don't think you can do it for the purposes of influencing an election. I think that might be a little... Well, here, here's the other problem. You're now, with the help of AMI, establishing a, not a one-off or a two-off, you're potentially establishing like a revolving business like Mm -hmm. a a consistent which is where the conspiracy comes in and this is also where the whispers of rico charges have come into play where Mm -hmm. like if you have a consistent criminal enterprise where you're engaging in this regularly that could be a big deal um and that's i think that's where they're going with this which is they're opening up the door with ami to say here are all the things that trump has done over the years to act as an informant but also engage in business records manipulation through these payoffs Mm -hmm. and here is the proof of that through ami gotcha all right ready when ami later concluded the story was not true okay read this okay suppressing woman one's account about five months before the presidential election in or around or in or about june 2016 the editor-in-chief of the national Inquirer and AMI's chief content officer, the AMI editor-in-chief, contacted lawyer A about a woman, woman one, who alleged that she had a sexual relationship with the defendant while he was married. I believe this is Stormy Daniels, right? Um, The AMI editor-in-chief updated lawyer A regularly about the matter over text message and by telephone. The defendant did not want this information to become public because he was concerned about the effect it could have on his candidacy. Thereafter, the defendant, the AMI CEO, and lawyer A had a series of discussions about who should pay off woman one to secure her silence. AMI ultimately paid $150,000 to woman one in exchange for her agreement not to speak out about the alleged sexual relationship, as well as for two magazine cover features of woman one and a series of articles that would be published under her byline. There's another topic for Trump's hypocrisy. Trump threw a coin buying stories from crooked media. You can't trust the media. I bought all this. Oh, true. <laughs> true, actually. Oh, no, no, no. You can never criticize Trump for that because if you point out to conservatives like, well, look, isn't Trump kind of rigging the media? Then all the conservatives say, oh, well, he's just playing the same game everybody else is playing. The media is already r- rigged. Yeah. Um, Dave Chappelle had a bit about this where he called him an honest liar, basically. Um, AMI falsely characterized the payment in AMI's books and records, including in its general ledger. This is another reason why I think that what they did is probably illegal. I'm get, I mean, there's probably a law we just look at, but like, it was probably illegal. That's probably why they're mischaracterizing the payments because they know this is illegal, right? <laughs> Uh, the AMI CEO agreed to the deal after discussing it with both the defendant and lawyer A, and on the understanding from lawyer A that the defendant or the Trump organization would reimburse AMI. Oh, the 150K was to Catherine McDougal. Gotcha, gotcha. In a conversation captured in an audio recording in approximately September 2016 concerning Woman One's account, the defendant and lawyer A discussed how to obtain the rights to Woman One's story, Woman One's account from AMI, and how to reimburse reimburse AMI for its payment. Lawyer A told the defendant he would open up a company for the transfer of Woman One's account and other information, and stated that he had spoken to the chief financial officer for the Trump organization, the TOCFO, about how to set the whole thing up. The defendant asked, so what do we have to, what do we got to pay for this, 150, and suggested paying by cash. When lawyer A disagreed, the defendant then mentioned payment by check. After the conversation, lawyer A created a shell company called Resolution Consultants, LLC, on or about September 30th, 2016. Less than two months before the election, on or about September 30th, 2016, the AMI CEO signed an agreement in which AMI agreed to transfer its rights to Woman One's account to Lawyer A's shell company for $125,000. However, after the assignment agreement was signed, but before the reimbursement took place, the AMI CEO consulted with AMI's general counsel and then told Lawyer A that the deal to transfer rights to Lawyer A's shell company was off. Suppressing Woman 2's account. 
About one month before the election, on or about October 7th, 2016, news broke that the defendant had been caught on tape saying to the host of Access Hollywood, I just start kissing them, women. It's like a magnet, just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they'll let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. The evidence shows that both the defendant and his campaign staff were concerned that the tape would harm his visibility as a, or viability as a candidate and reduce his standing with female voters in particular. Shortly after the Access Hollywood tape became public, the AMI editor-in-chief contacted the AMI CEO about another woman, woman two, who alleged she had a sexual encounter with the defendant while he was married. The AMI CEO told the AMI editor-in-chief to notify Lawyer A. On or about October 10th, 2016, the AMI editor-in-chief connected Lawyer A with Woman 2's lawyer, Lawyer B. Lawyer A then negotiated a deal with Lawyer B to secure Woman 2's silence and prevent disclosure of the damaging information in the final weeks before the residential election. Under the deal, that lawyer being negotiated, woman two would be paid $130,000 for the rights to her account. Damn, these women just fuck a guy and get paid big bucks for it. The defendant directed lawyer A to delay making a payment to woman two as long as possible. He instructed lawyer A that if they could delay the payment until after the election, they could avoid paying altogether. <laughs> what? The defendant directed lawyer A to delay making a payment to woman two as long as possible. He instructed lawyer A that if they could delay the payment until after the election, they could avoid paying altogether. Because at that point, it would not matter if the story became public. As reflected in emails and text messages between and among lawyer A, lawyer B, and the AMI editor-in-chief, lawyer A attempted to delay making payment as long as possible. Ultimately, with pressure mounting and the election approaching, the defendant agreed to the payoff and directed lawyer A to proceed. Lawyer A discussed the deal with the defendant and the TOCFO. The defendant did not want to make the $130,000 payment himself and asked lawyer A and the TOCFO to find a way to make the payment. After discussing various payment options with the TOCFO, lawyer A agreed he would make the payment. Before making the payment, lawyer A confirmed with the defendant that defendant that the defendant would pay him back. On or about October 26, shortly after speaking with the defendant on the phone, phone, lawyer A opened a bank account in Manhattan in the name of Essential Consultants LLC, a new shell company he had created to effectuate the payment. He then transferred $131,000 from his personal home equity line of credit into that account. On or about October 27th, lawyer A wired 130 grand from his Essential Consultants LLC account in New York to lawyer B to suppress woman 2's account. Post-election communications with AMI CEO. On November 8th, 2016, the defendant won the presidential election and became the president-elect. Thereafter, AMI released both the doorman and woman won from their NDAs, their non-disclosure agreements. Isn't HELOC only for personal renovations of their house? I thought it was, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you're going to get HELOC for anything. I don't know. The defendant was inaugurated as president on January 20th, 2017. Between election day and inauguration day, during the period of the defendant's transition to his role as president, the defendant met with the AMI CEO privately in Trump Tower in Manhattan. The defendant thanked the AMI CEO for handling the stories of the doorman and woman one and invited the AMI CEO to the inauguration. The summer of 2017, the defendant invited the AMI CEO to the White House for a dinner to thank him for his help during the campaign. The defendant falsified business records. Shortly after being elected president, the defendant arranged to reimburse lawyer A for the payoff he made on the defendant's behalf. In or around January 2017, the TO, CFO, and lawyer A met to discuss how lawyer A would be reimbursed for the money he paid to ensure woman 2's silence. The TO, CFO asked lawyer A to bring a copy of a bank statement for the essential consultant's account showing the $130,000 payment. The TO, CFO, and lawyer A agreed to a total repayment of an amount of $420,000. Blaze it! They reached the figure by adding $130,000 payment to a $50,000 payment for another expense, for which lawyer A also claimed reimbursement for a total of $180K. The TO, CFO then doubled the amount to three hundred and sixty, so that lawyer A could characterize the payment as income on his tax returns instead of a reimbursement, and lawyer A would be left with $180,000 after paying approximately 50% or 50 in income taxes. Finally, the TOCFO added an additional 60K as a supplemental year end bonus. Together, these amounts totaled $420,000. The TOCFO memorialized, memorialized these calculations and handwritten notes on the copy of the bank statement that Lawyer A had provided. The defendant, the TOCFO, and Lawyer A then agreed that Lawyer A would be paid the $420,000 through 12 monthly payments of $35,000 over the course of 2017. Each month, Lawyer A was to send an invoice to the defendant through Trump Organization employees, falsely requesting payment of $35,000 for legal services rendered in a given month of 2017, pursuant to a retainer agreement. At no point did Lawyer A have a retainer agreement with the defendant of the Trump Organization. They couldn't even fake a retainer. In early February 2017, the defendant and Lawyer A met in the Oval Office at the White House and confirmed their, this repayment arrangement. On or about February 14th, 2017, Lawyer A emailed the controller of the Trump Organization, the TO controller, the first monthly invoice, which stated, pursuant to the retainer agreement, kindly remit payment for services rendered for the months of January and February 2017. 
The invoice requested payment in the amount of $35,000 for each of these two months. The TO CFO approved the payment and in turn, the TO controller sent the invoice to the Trump Organization Accounts Payable Supervisor, the TO Accounts Payable Supervisor, with the following instructions, post to legal expenses, put retainer for the months of January, February, 2017 in the description. They're interviewing Trump's lawyer right now. Wait on which, or just link to the YouTube video afterwards. Lawyer A submitted 10 similar monthly invoices by email to the Trump Organization for the remaining months of 2017. Each invoice falsely stated that it was being submitted pursuant to the retainer agreement and falsely requested payment for services rendered for a month of 2017. In fact, there was no such retainer agreement and Lawyer A was not being paid for services rendered any months of 2017. The TO controller forwarded each invoice to the TO accounts payable supervisor. Consistent with the TO controller's initial instructions, the TO accounts payable supervisor printed out each invoice and marked it with an accounts payable stamp in the general ledger code 51505 for legal expenses. The Trump Organization maintained the invoices as records of expenses paid. As instructed, the TO Accounts Payable Supervisor recorded each payment of the Trump Organization, falsely describing it as a legal expense, trying to obtain a digital entry agreement, calling a voucher, and these vouchers, like vouchers or expenses, became part of the general, general ledgers. Is there anything interesting in here? The check stub falsely recorded the payment as retainer, retainer. The remaining nine checks, course, one of the ones from April through December, were paid by the defendant personally. Oh, the interview is muted top right. Uh, attorney slash fixer to Stormy Daniels. One is a $150,000 payment made What's from up? the National Enquirer parent company, AMI, uh, to Karen McDougal, a former Playboy Playmate of the Month, uh, who also had alleged uh, a relationship with Donald Trump. Uh, and then third, a payment from AMI to a doorman uh, for a claim he was making that AMI later determined to, to, to be false. Um, do you dispute those three actions, which uh, I'm not sure, I mean, I, sus I suspect uh, that the, in the district attorney is alleging that these are uh, violations of federal election uh, laws, uh, even though I don't think they go after the president, the former president, for those laws. But do you, dis do you dispute these assertions that these three actions happened? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not going to you know, try the case with you that way or piecemeal it. Let me just say, like, that's not going to add up to a case where Alvin Bragg has jurisdiction. Never mind the complete lack of discretion. Never mind the fact that it's a personal political uh, persecution when it comes to announcing target first and trying to string together evidence later. But that's what it goes to. You know, when you have a guy that runs for office saying, I will get Donald Trump, it shouldn't be a surprise that he will string together a flimsy case because he feels like, hey, this is how I got here. I've got to do it. And it turns upside down how prosecutors are supposed to act in this country. You know, See, they're supposed to begin judiciously. And that's not where we are. We're, we're, we're picking and choosing a target to try to pin charges on. And, you know, it's a sad day. Do you, do you know any details about what happened when Mr. Trump went in for processing before he went into the courtroom? Let me just rest real quick. One second. Yeah, I just want to know who Lawyer C is. House. I'm pretty sure scene. Lawyer D, it Those looks like Trump reading this, is uh, potentially right after they got Giuliani, their but I'm not quite sure. Not guilty, do you know if... Um, his social media post. You heard Joe Tacopino saying... Wait, so saying, you know, do you know, is it a crime to try to pay to cover up something that could influence an election? Is that a crime? Ooh. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. We'll go look it up. But... Okay. You're, the, you're a resident researcher now. <laughs> DA is speaking on MSNBC. Today. Oh. Earlier this afternoon, Donald Trump was arraigned on a New York Supreme Court indictment, returned right. by a Manhattan oh. grand jury on 34 felony no, counts <laughs> of falsifying right, business records those, yeah. in yeah, the yeah, first yeah. degree. Under New York state law, it is a felony to falsify business records with intent to defraud and an intent to conceal another crime. That is exactly what this case is about. 34 false statements made to cover up other crimes. These are felony crimes in New York state, no matter who you are. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. The defendant repeatedly made false statements on New York business records. 
He also caused others to make false statements. The defendant claimed that he was paying Michael Cohen for legal services performed in 2017. This simply was not true. And it was a false statement that the defendant made month after month in 2017. April, May, June, and so on through the rest of the year. For nine straight months, the defendant held documents in his hand containing this key lie, that he was paying Michael Cohen for legal services performed in 2017. And he personally signed checks for payments to Michael Cohen for each of these nine months. In total, the grand jury found there were 34 documents with this critical false statement. Why did Donald Trump repeatedly make these false statements? The evidence will show that he did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. Donald Trump, executives at the publishing company American Media Incorporated, Mr. Cohen and others agreed in 2015 to a catch and kill scheme. That is a scheme to buy and suppress negative information to help Mr. Trump's chance of winning the election. As part of this scheme, Donald Trump and others made three payments to people who claimed to have negative information about Mr. Trump. To make these payments, they set up shell companies and they made yet more false statements, including, for example, in AMI, American Media Incorporated's business records. One of the three people that they paid to keep quiet was a woman named Stormy Daniels. Less than two weeks before the presidential election, Michael Cohen wired $130,000 to Stormy Daniels' lawyer. That payment was to hide damaging information from the voting public. The participant scheme was illegal. The scheme violated New York election law, which makes it a crime to conspire to promote a candidacy by unlawful means. The $130,000 wire payment exceeded the federal campaign contribution cap. And the false statements in AMI's books violated New York law. That is why Mr. Trump made false statements about his payments to Mr. Cohen. He could not simply say that the payments were a reimbursement for Mr. Cohen's payments to, Sandy, to Stormy Daniels. To do so, to make that true statement would have been to admit a crime. So instead, Mr. Trump said that he was paying Mr. Cohen for fictitious legal services in 2017 to cover up actual crime committed the prior year. And in order to get Michael Cohen his money back, they planned one last false statement. In order to complete the scheme, they planned to mischaracterize the repayments to Mr. Cohen as income to the New York State tax authorities. The conduct I just described, uh, and that which was charged by the grand jury, is felony criminal conduct in New York State. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg holding a short news conference, uh, shedding a little more light on the thinking hmm. behind this indictment against 34 charges against former President Trump uh, related to falsifying business records. And uh, let me let me go around the horn here with our, 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 our panelists. Laura, first of all, this is now hinging, it sounds like, on a state crime that makes it a felony, not, not a so federal kind of crime, what I as, thought as we anticipated. Well, he mentioned um, federal crimes, too. Obviously, there's and federal that gives a little bit um, more insight limits on the amount. Is less surprising, Wait, especially what, um, what Bragg had to say is kind of more on the line of what I was kind of expecting him to say, which is not so much a surprise. Um, that New York election law that he's charging is the basis for all of this seems to be very vague, but it is an actual law about promotion of candidates or trying to prevent elections. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the what the statute of limitations are on that. I'd have to look it up more, more succinctly, but yeah, it's 
a, he he's going for the the broader kind of conspiracy issue mm-hmm. with AMI. So that's connecting it. it to the yeah. Um, he said they have new evidence, I guess, that federal prosecutors didn't have, and it's connected to a state law. Um, federal prosecutors aren't generally going to prosecute for states state laws, right? Yeah, they're not unless there's some sort of federal uh, component to it. Now, they might as part of like some sort of federal prosecution for um, election fraud at the federal level Mm -hmm. to say like, okay, your falsification of these business records at the state level constitutes a violation of federal um, election law because you didn't properly disclose these payments as related to the election and Mm -hmm. you hid them as typical business payments. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you're you're dealing with some weird stuff at that point and there's a reason why the feds have kind of been skittish on bringing this but i don't think maybe they had the same access to information i'd be yeah, interested that, i to mean s- that's the thing is the new evidence i wonder how compelling the new evidence they found was yeah my my question is going to be um how does this play out in the longer term with the ami stuff and whether or not that potentially has any play with other investigations um related to any sort of uh, election fraud on his part does this play also potentially uh i don't want to say into georgia but does this underlie other behaviors that they might want to look closer at ami for in relation to donald trump and what he may have said during the 2016 elections like give an example of that what do you mean um, any sort of negative press about other candidates or something like that that may have ran during uh, the 2016 election about Hillary or other uh, potential uh, primary is that, opponents. Is that, a, is that illegal on federal or state levels to pay a publication it, to run negative stories about somebody? Well, generally speaking, yes. But also the, the issue would be uh, how is that characterized from the federal election? expenditures that's that's usually what it comes down to right it's there's a lot that you can pay for for federal election stuff and this goes back to a lot of people pushing back on these charges specifically using john edwards as an example because he also paid a woman during his presidential campaign that he had an affair with to keep quiet and Mm -hmm. ultimately they didn't prosecute because they were trying to discuss how federal election funds can be spent but it would be interesting to see if this opens up a whole can of worms on his part to see okay what other stuff has he potentially paid off using ami in the past as far as negative stories about himself or to promote stories about others that might lie into some sort of other business records issues um other tax fraud issues that sort of thing hmm. i read that in my statute of limitations because there's there's also potentially now a federal component for uh, tax fraud true? on this too these charges are fair game uh, if he's mischaracterizing these payments and the feds and the irs agrees that these are mischaracterized payments you know that you're not properly disclosing them could that be or if you're trying to take them for instance if you're trying to take them as business expenses for tax deduction purposes and they're clearly not business yeah, well, like, what's expenses. What's our max charges here for stuff like this? Yeah. Well, for the business records, for all uh, the felony is a class E felony, so I think it's four years oh. is what I've been hearing. Okay. So sure. four years for each charge would be the maximum. So it's right, like is that normally served concurrently, or I have that... no idea. That's that's a more of a New York law question. I'm I'm unfortunately not a New York law, uh, attorney, so I don't know their system as well as a New York attorney would, but. Mm-hmm. Um, concurrently, probably, I I would be remiss to see that they're going to sit there and be like, you've got to serve them subsequently to like one 80, another. Yeah, like eighty yeah. years in jail for falsifying like ten like. Tax yeah, kind of I don't even. It's also going to be super interesting on the statute of limitations for this one, because that's another argument that has to come into play. Because there's an argument that. You can't indict a sitting president, but there's still the statute of limitations. So nobody's ever ruled on something like this before. Um, Whether or not his presidency has an effect on the statute of limitations, Mm -hmm. because if it if it doesn't, then arguably one of the things that they were talking about doing is, you know, dismissing on the statute of uh, limitations. Well, if we if this has been upgraded to dealing with the felony stuff, though, right, statute of limitations haven't expired yet, have they? 
I again, I'm I'm not an expert, so I would have to. I believe the statute of limitations, from what I've seen from the news, is that it's five years. So if these were made in yeah, but it's only five years if it wasn't done. If these like t falsifying of records wasn't done in the commission of another crime, right? I thought it was the commission of another crime thing that upgrades the statute of limitations on this. Yeah, it it might yes, but then again, the statute of limitations since since they are going for New York state election law, they might be able to get it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I know when they were talking about possibly looping it into um, hold on. Okay. It, looping it into the federal level, that is where there was an issue as to whether or not that would hold true because you'd be talking about federal election laws being enforced by a state. But because they found this kind of one off, um, it, this one off law, which is like super vague, we're, we're going to see. Um, but I'm looking mostly towards, as far as the details on statute of limitations towards people who are far more knowledgeable in New York state law than I am. Huh. So that's it. I mean, it'll be super interesting. They're not going the federal route, which is going to be uh, more difficult for Trump to dismiss huh. because of the fact that you're now dealing with a state election law as the underlying crime that they're trying to tie everything into. Mm hmm. So we'll see how that all handles out. But yeah, I mean, this is this is just prime bait for a lot of people to speculate on for the next couple of months, at least until things shake out. Mm -hmm. We'll see if he gets in trouble with the judge over the gag order tonight. That'll be super interesting to see. Wait, if I think they said there was no gag order. Well, the, I shouldn't say the gag order. You're correct. You mean over the him just judges, not like insulting the, the, or threatening family members and shit on social media, right? Yeah, the sure. the judges the judges instructions uh, regarding social media. And what was interesting and that I found about what was said is um, the judge applied it both to the witnesses for the prosecution as well as to Trump. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about some of the stuff that Michael Cohen said and Stormy Daniels have said. Like they're trying to rein everybody in. Mm -hmm which should help but we'll see if it does anything for trump so that's about it okay well all right be careful see ya that you can how does it become a tested legal theory no this Still. if anything i think this makes it a little bit more complicated and a, a little bit tricky for him generally election federal election law right. issues are nope. prosecuted by federal prosecutors and there is going to be a swift motion to dismiss i would predict uh if in short order from the former president's lawyers saying all of this should be preempted by federal law meaning that this should have been bought by federal prosecutors, not by a state district attorney in Manhattan. Now, whether that will succeed remains to be seen. You see the district attorney saying, look, we brought plenty of- your personal thoughts so far? Um, oh, hi. Uh, I'm curious what the history is for the enforcement of the paying for election information, or I'm sorry, paying to suppress information on an election. Like, what is the, is this a very strong law that gets enforced often? Is this the first time there's ever been a charge for this? I think that's a pretty important question to ask. Um, I mean, if he did falsify records over trying to pay people off to not publish negative information about him, um, and if that is indeed like a state crime relating to elections in New York, now the question becomes like, have people, is this like standard practice? Have a lot of people participated in this and never been busted for it? And Trump is the first one because this DA just really doesn't like Trump. Um, these are, this is obviously like the most important question, or this is like one of the most important questions, right? Because the, the worry um, or the thing that Republicans are saying, obviously, like, oh, this is all political. Like, this isn't even a real thing. Like, nobody cares. And they'd have more credence to that if it was the case that like nobody's ever, um, nobody's ever been charged with this crime before. And it kind of looks bad if you're creating new crimes or, or like not enforcing novel crimes on a guy that's so politically unpopular, you know? Or unpopular with you for political reasons, maybe I should say. Bro, okay, this game, if this game is gonna have maps like this, it needs to have like a speed up function. <laughs> Uh, 
It's a little wacky that I have one wave on day 57. That's pretty wacky. Of false business record Casey saying it's bread and butter. He hasn't brought one like this where you've actually obtained a jury conviction. It's gone up on appeal where it's been tested. That's why people say it's been untested. Even if they've charged false business records cases before, they haven't used a case, they haven't used a federal election law as the hook where that's been upheld but on appeal where you can actually see a court saying, yes, this is okay. We give this the stamp of authority. It was interesting to hear him say that the law doesn't actually require require that the indictment have the conspiracy and all of the other election issues pled as separate counts. Again, what remains to be seen how the courts test that out, how they evaluate something like that. Uh, at, at the beginning of his remarks, I was struck by how much he's trying to emphasize nobody is above the law. You hear prosecutors say that all the time. But of course, in, in a case like this with a defendant like this, um, he seemed to want to <laughs> stake the ground that um, this is not something uh, that I did because of who the president is almost sort of implicitly. Uh that is true, but have you seen the polling showing people on both sides, Dems and Rips, view what he did as criminal? If you take out the names, Trump and Daniels, not the public opinion terms of criminality, but neutrally speaking, the charge has legitimacy. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. If those polls exist, you should link them. That'd be very interesting. The, the feeling that I have on just a gut feeling is that it's pretty bad. What he did is pretty bad. If you are buying off negative stories ahead of an election, um, that feels pretty bad. If that feels like something that should be pretty illegal. Um, that feels like something that should be pretty illegal. It doesn't feel good. Uh, but again, like the novelness of has anybody ever been charged with this before is pretty important. Or has this electioneering angle been used to upgrade these particular charges before it ever happened before? If it's a novel application of the law, then that kind of feels pretty shitty if we're getting a novel application of the law on a historically unpopular guy, right? Because that's always gonna feel political. That's the issue. What's up, Ayla? Aha, Ayla, the next bridge burner. Haha, <laughs> have we taken pull? Is there a mana market on how that's gonna happen? To be fair, isn't this a president-only thing? Well, theoretically, no, any politician could buy off shit like this, right? Theoretically. It doesn't just feel political, it is political, come on. What do you mean, it is political, come on? Like, it's so obvious. Do you think that there haven't been any laws broken? Do you think that they just lied about everything they said? You need, you, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna make the statement it's political, you're gonna have to like work your brain a little bit to say that it's political. You can't just say, it's political, because I like Donald Trump. You can't, you can't charge my guy with crime. Uh, what about Obama? Drones in Yemen, uh. Like, if you're gonna say it's political, fine. But you need to demonstrate why this particular charge is, is not good. And it seems like, assuming everything they've on the indictment is true, and assuming the statement of fact is correct, it feels pretty shitty. It happened to them in 2011. Is this the John Edwards thing, or? Oh, yeah. 